Hey, we're talking about evidence. Just real quickly, I'll just tell you, I want you to save a date on your calendars, if you will. August 3rd, 21st, August 21st, we are going to come together and celebrate the evidence that is indeed all around us, celebrate what's happened over the last five years as we celebrate five years as a church on August 21st. And for those of us who have been around the whole time and for those of us who have been watching God move in incredible ways, uh, we know that this has been because a war has been fought. A war has been fought in the heavenlies and a war has been fought in seeing what uh, God can do in our lives. And so we're, we're excited about that. Hey, we've been in a series about war and this war that we're engaged in over the last three weekends. And uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I have gotten a lot out of this series. I've gotten a lot of studying for it. I felt like I was telling the elders as we met Tuesday with our elders, I, I felt like that we had seen a moment in time in our church where it was time to really say, okay, it's time to fight the war. It's time to fight for our freedom as believers. It's time to fight for our freedom in Christ that he's given us. And that for our church, it was time to kind of declare war against the enemy and, and declare that, that we uh, had land that was ours in our lives and was no longer the enemy's. And so we've been doing that over this last couple of weekends, that what we've seen is that we are in a war and that we cannot stay behind in this war. We've got to stay out front fighting the battle. Uh, we saw that there's a real enemy who wants to destroy us, he wants to take us down, and that the war really is a spiritual war. Right when we begin to think that it is a natural one, we realize that it is a war being fought in the heavenlies and is very much a spiritual war. But the good news is we have been given spiritual weapons and weapons in the heavenlies to fight this war, and they are weapons of warfare. In fact, we learned how to use these weapons. Um, last week we looked at uh, truth for the last couple of weekends and just kind of being self-aware and allowing people to speak truth into your lives and living under the truth of God's word. We talked about um, righteousness, that we need to guard our souls um, from the things that affect our hearts, that we need to guard our hearts very much so. Uh, we talked about the weapons of peace and that we have this weapon of peace in our life and mostly that we have peace with God and being at peace with God and knowing that if he is for us, who can be against us? Is, isn't that good to know when you go into the war that if he's for us, then who can be against us? If he's won the war already, that the battles and the skirmishes that come at us, um, that, that he's going to take care of those. Uh, we saw the word of God as a weapon for us, as the sword of the, the spirit it called it and we learn from it. We quote from it. We quote against the lies that Satan would want to, to whisper into our ears about our lives. And then we said, like faith, trusting in God, walking through the dark valley that is the gap between what we see and what God says. And it's called faith. And when we have faith, we walk through that valley knowing that he is with us. He's walking with us. And then there were two more that we kind of touched base on just a little bit, but we said we want to talk about more this weekend. We left the helmet of salvation and we left prayer um, just a little uncovered last weekend because they really play into how, um, how, how we kind of fight with these weapons and how right now here on this earth we, we use these weapons and how they kind of go into our lives and come into our lives as weapons that, that we can use. So let's read the scripture again. For these two, from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. It says, put on salvation as your helmet. And pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So, all right, so Paul is teaching, we, we know this, to a group of, of Christ's followers. He's writing a letter to a church people who have allowed Jesus to save them. They're, they're already saved. They already have had this event of salvation. And now they are being saved in this continuous motion. They're becoming more like Jesus. So this progressive salvation is what theologians would talk about, that we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. There's this process in which we become more like Jesus. So there is this event 
And, and most of us, a lot of us in this room have, have had that event. I think there are some of you here who have not had the event of salvation, of saying, Jesus, I'm allowing you to save me. In fact, that's one of our chief prayers here at Freedom Church is that people far from God would find freedom in Christ. And the first step to finding that freedom is that you would say, you know, I've never done that. I've never allowed Jesus to save me. And you can do that even this weekend. We would love for you to do that. But there's those of us who have had that event. And then there's ongoing, this ongoing becoming more and more like Jesus. And Paul says, interestingly, that you need to cover your head with this salvation. Stated another way, I'd say it like this, if you think about what we know about, you know, our head and what's in our head and, and all that kind of good stuff is I would say that you need to protect your mind with this helmet of salvation. And so, sort of the most important piece of armor that we wear is the protection of the most vulnerable kind of part of our, our, our body, and that is the head that leads the way in battle. That is the head that's the tallest thing to be shot at by the arrows of the enemy. And he says you need to protect your mind. So let me ask you a question to kind of get help us wrap around this subject today. And that is, do, do you have any issues do you have any issues? Anybody here have any issues? Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you have issues. No, you have issues. Now, some of you did that really, really quickly. And that's your issue. Like you need to learn some personal space. You just don't need to turn to your neighbor so quickly. That's just too quick. You did that. And then some of you are procrastinators. You'll turn to your neighbor in about 45 seconds to a minute and be like, hey, you got issues. But I procrastinated because you procrastinate everything. You know, you're just putting it off. Some of you are just stubborn. You're like, I'm not turning to any neighbor. I'm not telling. I'm not talking in church. That's your issue. You're prideful. Like you can't even turn to your neighbor. You got issues. Some of you are like, I don't have any issues. I'm good. But that's your issues. You're lying to yourself because you got issues. And the person beside you who told you you got issues, they probably know the issues you got because they know you better than you do. But we all have issues. We all have issues. And do you know something that, that science shows us and the Bible uh, already told us is that most of our issues start with our thinking. Starts with our thinking. In fact, most of the battles that you're fighting right now in your life begin with your thinking. And Paul says, protect your mind. So why was Paul saying this? Here's why. Because he knew what Proverbs said. Proverbs says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. So Paul is saying, look, we need to put on the helmet of salvation. We need to protect the most vulnerable part of your body, which is your mind. Because we know this, your life is shaped by your thoughts. You see, your thoughts create a filter in which you see and live through. Like, like the way you think about things shapes everything in the way you see it. The, the way that you have thought, pre-thought about the meeting that you're going to go into shapes everything about how you're going to receive what's in that meeting. The, the way you thought about how you come into church. If you think you're just coming here to check off a box and you're going to go to church and maybe you'll kind of learn something today, maybe you won't, but you kind of sit there and you're passively maybe thinking something might happen, it, it, it affects. You have a filter in which everything that happens now will go through. If you come in here, though, expecting and thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be moved by God today. There, there's a miracle that's going to happen today. I'm expecting this something. Everything will be received differently. You have a filter in which you, your whole life goes through. And because of this, because of this, your mind is a battlefield. Think about it. If the enemy wants to do what? Destroy your life lie to you and see you in the end, all of your dreams and all your desires, everything to be dead and your relationship with God to be dead. He wants to take all of that down. And if your life is shaped by your thoughts, then where would the enemy of your soul be best to spend most of his time? In your head. I mean, he, he's going to get up in your thoughts. He's going to whisper into your mind thoughts. He's going to prepare you for everything that you're going into to prepare this filter that will shape everything in your life. And Paul knew this and he wrote in Ephesians, of course, for us to put on this armor. But he also wrote in the book of Romans something that I think we need to learn from. 
He said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? Praying more. By what? No, going to church more. By being, being, more, being a better Christian. I just need to be a better Christian. I need, to, need to, I need to stop doing all the things I'm not supposed to be doing. I need to start doing the things I'm supposed to be doing. Behavior modification. Being a better husband. Being a better wife. No, no, no. He said, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Be transformed by the renewal of your thinking. Be transformed by that. And then he says, but put salvation's helmet on your mind so that your thinking will fall into line with this fact. Jesus has saved you. See, when the filter is, wait a minute, the, the enemy of my soul is telling me I messed up so much in the past. There's no way God could ever, ever love me. There's no way he could ever, ever accept me. You go, wait a minute, Jesus died on the cross for me. He saved me. Like, that changes everything. I'm renewing my mind. I can never be the husband that I think I ought to be. I can never make the decisions that I think I need to make. I, I can, can't do all that stuff. I just don't have that within me. Well, wait a minute, though. Jesus saved me. I was a price. I, had, I was worth paying the price for. And Jesus saved me. That changes everything. He says, put that on in your thinking. Thinking. Another translation of Romans 12, 2 adds the words, patterns of this world. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. And how do shapes, how do, how do thoughts shape your life? How does that happen? Well, remember, who or what you give access to has authority in your life. And the more access you give to the enemy through your thoughts, the more access you give to those who are being used by the enemy, they're not the enemy, but they're being used by the enemy to shape your thoughts. The more access you give to uh, outside sources, whether it's the media or whether it's the things you read or whatever it is, the more access you give, the more authority they have in your life. And here's what science has shown us. Now, remember, the Bible's already told us this in Proverbs. The Bible's already told us this through Paul and numerous other places. It talks about our thinking. The Bible had already said this. So science is not proving this to be, or is not making this true. It's just coming along and confirming what the Bible has already shown us. But science has shown us that the brain creates a pathway every time we have a thought. Every single time, a literal pathway, not a theoretical pathway, but the brain creates these little grooves in your mind, these little pathways in your mind when you have a thought. And the next time you have that thought, it travels through the same area and it starts to make a bigger groove and a deeper rut in your brain system. And what happens is, is over time, when you have this thought that comes up and you've got to make a decision of which way the thought is going to go, if there's a deep enough groove in your brain, where is your mind going to go? It's going to go to where the deepest rut already is. And so it kind of follows in. There's this rut system that goes. What, what would we maybe call that? Could we call that maybe a pattern, and he says, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. There is a way of thinking that the enemy of your soul would have you think. There is a way of thinking that the world thinks. There's a way of thinking that we in our natural, not saved by the grace of Jesus, not renewed in our minds, think. There's a natural way that we go. And he says, if you take that path long enough, you will create these ruts that that's where your mind will always want to go. And so over time, a mindset is formed. And so one of the greatest battlefields that we have is in renewing or changing our mindsets. I would, I would venture to say, including myself, that all of us here have areas of our lives where we need a mindset change. We've seen a mindset change. There, there's a lot of stimuli going on outside of our minds. There's a lot of circumstances that are happening that we can't control. There's a lot of decisions and choices that people outside of our control are making. But the truth of the matter is most of what we deal with, most of what we struggle with is a mindset problem. It's a thinking problem. In fact, some of you here have a scarcity mindset that there's only so much good in the world and you're just not going to get any of it. You know, you're just like, man, I'm, it's just things like that just don't happen to me. I just, don't, I just don't get the breaks in life. I just can't catch a break. And so everything you see, you go, there, there it is. 
Confirmation again. Confirmation of fact that I just never catch a break. Confirmation of fact that I can never get a win. Confirmation of fact that I can never make the right choices. Confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. Now what happens, the Bible tells us that it shapes our, our thinking shapes our life. So what does that tell me? The more I think that, a scarcity mindset, the more I think that there's this no going to be breaks for me, I'm going to end up, watch, taking paths in life that are being pushed forward and shaped by my thoughts, and I think stuff is just happening to me. Like, I think, you know, it's just the way it is, it just always has that. And what I don't realize is my thinking about the situation shaped my life. I made that poor decision again because I think, well, I mean, that's all I deserve. That's all I deserve. I mean, I don't deserve any better than that. I don't deserve any better friends than that. And, and so all along, we're going through these grooves and these patterns. We're being conformed to what the world says about us. The world said, you know what, you can never, you can never get a better job. You can never get a better, you can never get a better uh, promotion at work. You can never have anything like that. You can't have that. So, uh, I mean, I guess that's what it is. I'll just always be in this before. I mean, you can never get great friends. I mean, you, you're not even a good friend yourself. How can you get a great friend? You'll never get a great friend. So you just walk in the patterns of the world. So scarcity. Maybe some of you have a fear mindset. Just a fear mindset. Never take risk. Because you always consider the worst case scenario. So you get to every choice in your life. And you go, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? And that's where your mind goes. And so you never risk. You never take a chance. You, you never go, okay, let's see maybe what God could do. What is it? The gap between what I see and what God says is faith. But you never step out in faith because you go, man, my rut in my life tells me this is the way it's going to go. And I see the worst case scenario, so I never step out, never take a chance, never get anything new. Maybe you just have a negative mindset. Always assume the worst about people. Always assume the worst about situations. Can I, can I be honest with you? This is my um, just the rut in my life that I most easily go to is a negative mindset. I, I most easily can go and look and go, <laughs> well, look at there. Traffic's backed up again. I-26, man, all these people from Ohio moving here. That's what it is. That's what it is. I, I can get to the checkout, see the long line, and I most easily go, wouldn't you know it? I come at the time of day where everybody else in the world wants to come. I remember my grandfather, anytime he was driving, there was people on the road. He'd go, can you believe this? Who works anymore? Does anybody work anymore? Look at all these people driving. And I used to always go, Papa, you're not working either. You're out on the road too. What's going on there? You know, but that's how I, negative mindset. I have a negative, I, I, I tend to, my besetting sin, right, where I want to go to, where the grooves are deep for me, is to just assume the worst about people. Just go, you know why they did that? Because they're awful. That's why they did that. That's why they did that. Because they, they wanted, to, and so I have to fight against. I have to renew my mind and go, wait a minute, God, that's not what you've taught me about people. That's not what you've taught me about circumstances. That's not what you've taught, shown me about the people in my life who I love. That, that's not what, that's not, let's just, praise God, we get to be driving right now. Praise God, I live in a time where I get to drive in a car and I don't have a horse and a buggy. Why, why don't I ever go to that route? And I have to take and renew that thought process. And here's what I've learned from me. Be careful who you give your ear. Anybody ever ask you that? Yeah. Hey, can I just, can I have your ear for just a moment? Hey, can I just talk to you for just a moment? Or, or, or maybe who you give your ear that's not even asking for it by listening to it on, on the radio or by watching it on the news or reading it on the website. Because what I can do is I can easily fall into who I give my ear to because the, the ear, think about this, is the portal to the mind. And what you hear begins to shape your thoughts and your thoughts shape your life. I mean, this is just in the Bible. You go, then this seems really practical. This seems really scientific. And I go, no, no, no. This is biblical. This is what God told us. And what people whisper, if you let people whisper to you long enough, you may actually start to believe it. And you'll eventually go, okay, well, man, they're probably right. I bet they are trying to kind of take my place here at work. I bet they are. I bet everybody does not like me in that department. I, I, I bet I can't get ahead up. And so mindsets can drive you to success 
or they can drive you to failure. It says, it, it says actually, the power of life and death, the Bible tells us. Life, death. Two polar opposites. The power of life and death are in the tongue, the Bible tells us. In our words. And then our words go into our minds and it shapes our thoughts. And see, you can't think like a victim and walk like a victor. It's not possible. Y'all didn't hear that. I'm going to come over here where Berta talked to me. You can't think like a victim and then walk like a victor. Can't do it. You, you can't think, you know what, I mean, nothing's going to happen. Everybody hates me. Nobody likes me. I think I'll just go eat worms and see what happens. And, 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 and expect to live like a victor in life. Sometimes, you know what I've found? Sometimes I have to convince my mind, my thinker, I have to convince my thinker that, that, that what God says is true and not what I say is true. I have to say to myself, you know what, it's going to be great. I love sitting in traffic. It's going to give me some time to have wonderful conversation with my wife or my children. Or I can, I can listen to a book that I've been wanting to read. I pay for Audible every single month. What if I just listen to a book right now? I have to just talk myself into it because I can't think like a victim. Expect to be a victor. But Paul, Paul says, he says, let's get back to this. Don't fall into the ruts that this world has made. And, and how does this world do things? The way it thinks it should. I mean, I mean, the world is not making decisions based on wanting to have failure. But the world thinks that this is the way we should do it. So the world has a mindset. We would call that a worldview. There's a certain worldview that the world has. All the people around you who do not follow Jesus, who aren't saved by Jesus and his grace, and even some of those, listen, even some of those who are but have negative thinking. So sometimes there are Christ followers who are saved, but they got terrible thinking. And they're around you, and they're whispering into your ear, and, they're, and they, they're just talking about religious stuff, and they're just kind of pumping you up on negativity. And, and he says, listen, listen, the, the, the way that the world thinks is the pattern that the world's taking. And what I would say to the world, to quote the great theologian, Dr. Phil, is how is that working out for you? I mean, have you watched the news lately? Have you seen the way the world handles things? Have you seen the way the church, when they have a negative attitude, handles things? I mean, we need to find Jesus' thoughts <clears throat> on some of this stuff. And he says, listen, Proverbs 23, 7. For as a man thinks within himself, so he is. You, you want to know, why am I the way I am? Why do I have, ne I, asked, I asked myself this thought the other day. I was just in a particularly negative season. Why am I? Why am I like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I so negative right now? And I thought, for as a man thinks within himself, so he is. So, so let's look at the next part of this verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but, because so it's, not, it's not hopeless. In fact, here, here would be the title of my sermon today. If I, if I had a title, it would be, you can win the war. You can win the war. So, so do not be conformed to this world, but... Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. There's a word in the Bible that we all use a lot and have heard a lot, but, but maybe we don't really know what it means because what it means is going to teach us a lot about how to do this. And it's this word called repentance. Repentance. It's a Bible word. It's a church word. We use it a lot. But, but do we really know what it means? Repentance means a complete change of mind and heart. Remember, the seed of our emotions, our heart, our soul, the way we, our gut, the way we think. It's a complete change of our thinking and our gut. A process of transformation that takes place inside a person. When we repent, we change our minds, our thinking. And remember, for as a man is, thinks within himself, rather, so he is. And we have described, if you've been around the church at all for any amount of time, we, we've described for a long time in the church that repentance is this 180 degree turn. You've heard that before. What repentance is, is you're going this way, then you turn, and you go this way. And you're going this way, and you turn, and you go this way. The, the problem with that is, is it shows a lot about what we think about repentance. 
shows a lot about what the church thinks. Here's what the church typically and historically has taught people that repentance is. Change your outside action. So you're doing something you shouldn't do, don't do it anymore. Change your outside direction. You're not doing something that you should do, all right? Change your outside direction. So for some of you, you would think you have repented because you were breaking some commandment. And so you were breaking a commandment and you go, all right, well, I won't break that commandment anymore. I'm going to turn and go this way. But here's what happens is, because it was only an outside thing, eventually you, you're drawn back to what your heart and your thinking has shaped and filtered your life. And so there's this filter that's controlling your mind, and you can fight against the flow for so long. You can go, hey, don't do that anymore. Don't do that. That's bad. God doesn't like you if you do that. All right, well, I, can, I cannot do that. And you can white knuckle it for a long time and just, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. But eventually, your thinking and the pattern of the world draws you back into that because it was an outside action. Rather than, when in Ezekiel, it paints a little bit of a different picture. He says, and I will give you a new heart. Somebody say new heart. A new heart. Remember what a heart is? The seed of the emotions. I will give you a new gut. Some of the men here are like, I need a new gut. That would be great. I need less gut. That would be wonderful if I could have that. But he says, I'll give you a new gut. A new feel. It's a new feeling. I'll give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put where? Within you. Not the outside action. I'm going I'm to do something inside of you. And I will remove the heart of stone. He says that heart you had, that feeling that you had, the, the, the part of your soul that was without God, it's like a heart of stone. And he says, and, and from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And another translation says the heartbeat of God. I'm going to give you the heartbeat. I'm going to do something inside of you. I'm going to do something that's, that's not on, just on the outside. And in fact, if I were to par paraphrase this first, here's how I would say it. I'd say, I will give you a new way of thinking. I will remove the old way of thinking and give you a fresh, soft, vibrant way of thinking like God. And you're going to start to think like God. See, repentance is an ongoing process within us, not just an outside action. So we have to change the way we think. It says you literally change your mind. That's what repentance is. So let's dig in just a little bit more. You're walking along. You're, you're minding your own business. You're just living life. When boom, out of nowhere, there's this moment in time that there's this reminder that there's a war going on. It would be David who is up on a rooftop who stayed behind during the battle. And he finds himself up on his roof and he looks over and he sees the woman who is an attractive to him. And he has this moment where he realizes, you know what? There is a war going on. There's a battle for my thoughts. There's a battle for my mind. There's a battle for what will be my actions. For you, maybe, it's the divorce papers being served. Boom. From out of nowhere, there's a war going on. For you, maybe, it's falling into that temptation again that you struggle with over and over again. Boom. You fell into it again. And you go, wait a minute. There's a war going on. For you, it's cancer diagnosis being given. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Where did it come from? Then it's for you, it's your spouse walking out of the door, saying, I'm not coming back. That's it. You, you name your moment. But there's been a moment for you in recent time where you said, wait a minute, there's a war going on. There's a battle for my soul. And, and here's the deal. You're reminded that there's a war because a shot is fired across the battlefield of your mind. And you have a choice to make. What will I do? Will I have on the helmet of salvation? Will I put on the shield to guard my soul? What will I do? And you have a couple choices. In this moment in time, you're walking along, something happens, boom, it just happens, and you can just keep walking. In other words, just ignore what happened. Just stay in the rut. Stay in the rut. This is the way I've always thought. This is the way, I mean, this is where my thinking takes me. This is the rut that's there. I'm just going to keep walking. Another one is you're just walking along and boom, you're reminded of the war. And for some of us, we just stop. We just stop. And we're paralyzed in that moment. We're paralyzed in the fact that our life is falling around. But we can't go forward. We can't go backwards. We can't do anything. And many of you found yourself there. You were just paralyzed by fear, paralyzed by scarcity kind of mindset. And you're just paralyzed. You can't even let your thinking 
take you to the next step. Or maybe for others of you, you're, you're, you're kind of moving along and boom, it hits you. And for you, you go, wait a minute, let's go backwards. Let's go back to addictions that have kept me safe before. Let's go back to relationships that, that have helped me make it through it before that, that aren't healthy relationships. Let's go back to relationships with sin that I've had before. I'll just follow that rut backwards and my thinking will take me to a safe place. And it, you, you find a place where at least you know what's going on. You don't like what's going on, but at least you feel safe in that. Or, or you can have in this moment where you realize that there, there, there's a war going on. There's a battlefield in my mind that wants to whisper thoughts into my mind, that wants to take over and shape my life right now, that wants to shape my thinking. And you can repent. Change your thinking and therefore change your response. Because right now, you've got this rut. You ever, you, ever been, you ever said, I'm just in a rut? Just in a rut. You literally are. You're in a rut. It's just it's a way of thinking, a filter on my life that says this is the way I handle these situations. I get angry. I get depressed. I, I, just, I just pull away from everyone. He says, no, no, this is the rut. You've got to get out of the rut. You've got to change your response. So the question is, I guess, how is this moment that you're going through right now, and every single one of you have picked a moment. You're going through something right now. There, there's a way of thinking. There's a circumstance in your life. There's a relationship in your life. There's a challenge right now for every single one of us. And you've got to decide, how is this moment going to be used to change me? And to change my thinking. And I have just a couple practical ways that I think the Bible teaches us to handle this. Three daily habits to help renew your mind. The first is say what God says. Remember, there is what we see. And then there's a gap between it that is faith. And there is what God says. What if we began to echo what God says? What if even when we were over here, afraid to step into the faith, we just kept saying, you know what, this is what God says about my life. This is what God says that I am. This is who God says that I am. What we say can direct our way and can change our day. But what we say, remember, there's power of life and death in the tongue. And so we need to echo what God says. We need to echo what he's saying. Every moment. Every morning, rather, I take the time before I hit, uh, my feet hit the ground. I have a song that goes off on my uh, I iPhone, and it's been going off to wake me up for five years, over five years now. And it's the same song every morning. And it's, the song is, who, do, who He Says I Am. And it's, every morning it reminds me of who He Says I Am. And in fact, now it's, it's so crazy. It's gotten to where the, the, the song barely starts, and I go ahead and cut it off, and I get up. But immediately that song's in my mind, who He Says I Am. God, I'm going to be who you say that I am today. I'm going to be who you say that I am. Not who I say that I am. Not who my feelings say that I am. I'm going to be who you say that I am. Why? Because I need to say what God says. See, see there are declarations that can be made in our lives. And declarations need to be made, but declarations are often born in desperation. And I wonder if anybody here is just desperate for a change, desperate to be renewed, desperate for a different rut to kind of walk through and go, look, I need a different way of thinking. I'm desperate. So we start to declare what God says about us. Here's a few declarations that I would write down if I were you. And I would start declaring these every single day over my life. And my prayers are powerful and effective. When I pray, I'm a son of God. And they're powerful and they're protective. They're, uh, they are uh, effective. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. It's working. When I pray, God's meeting my needs. When I pray, God is answering my prayers. Number two, God richly supplies all of my needs. This is what the Bible teaches us. Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply every need. Somebody say every. every. Not some, not a few of them. Every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He's going to supply my needs. If I have a real need, God is going to supply it. Number three. I live under supernatural protection. See, see, I don't have to be in a natural stance all the time because there's supernatural protection over my life. Psalm 9111 says, he, for he will give the angels charge concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. I live under supernatural protection. So 
One daily habit is say what God says. The second one is laugh more. Laugh more. Have you guys noticed that we don't laugh enough, especially as Christ followers? Listen to this, Psalm 2, 4. He who sits in the heavens, that would be God, laughs. Aren't we supposed to be like God? Are we supposed to be following after him? How many of you know that it's easy when life gets busy to forget to laugh? Have you guys forgotten to laugh every now and then? You just forget to laugh. You get so stressed out. That's why we've made it one of our goals in the Wood Home to laugh every single day. I want to laugh. I want to laugh about something, and if I have to, I'll tickle people to make them laugh. We've made it a rite of passage in the Wood Home that you get tickled until you wet your pants. Like that is one of the things that has to happen. And I heard that going to the gym will make your body strong, and then laughing a lot will make your soul strong. And I don't like gyms, and I don't go to the gym. So I need to laugh a lot. I need to laugh a lot to really beef up. So one of my goals every day is to, I want to make Connie laugh hard. Like I want to see her laugh. I love to make her laugh. That means that I, I try a lot of different things. I always say, it's kind of comedians, they only get a hit every now and then. So you just got to keep trying. You got to keep trying. But I try to make her laugh. Uh, another goal is that I would be laughing. Listen, this, this is a parenting advice. I want to be laughing with my kids more than I'm lecturing my kids. I want, I, want, I want that to be, at the end of the week, I'm going to go, I, we laughed more than I lectured. And if I'm being honest, there's a lot of weeks when I end going, we lectured, I lectured more this week than I laughed. And I want to laugh with my kids. I want to laugh with them. We got to laugh more. We got to laugh more. At Freedom Church, we love to have fun. See, we see I think that humor is um, helpful. I think it helps people who are far from God. So I, I try to be fun. We, we want to be like Jesus. Um, you know, we, Jesus, I think Jesus was funny. Uh, you read some of the, the scripture and, and he really was funny. He was trying to be funny. And people laughed with him. I believe people laughed with him. I believe he had a good time. And as Christians, it means that we are to be little Christ. And so we are to laugh like Jesus. Now, some of you say, hey, what do you mean Jesus was funny? How, how do you mean Jesus? I don't understand Jesus funny. Let's be serious. Do you guys think that Jesus spent three years with 12 men, other men, on what really kind of was like an RV camping trip around the low country. And not once was there a pull my finger joke given. Do you guys, do you guys think of that? 12 men in an RV traveling around, there's going to be some jokes, right? right? And you say, does the Bible say, Pastor, that there was a pull my finger joke? No, it does not. But it doesn't say there wasn't. Like, so I'm going with it. It doesn't say there wasn't. But, but often we take ourselves way too seriously and God way too lightly. I mean, we, we just, we, 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 are, we walk around with f frowns on our faces. I have to tell myself all the time, remind your face that you're happy about what God has done for you. you just kind of slap it and say, hey, face, come along with me on this journey. And some of y'all need to do that. Your, your face says, I'm really angry right now about what God has done, and, but God's doing a great thing. We need to laugh more. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. We're talking about a war. You've got to have strength. So in Psalm 2, when it says that God sits in the heavens and he laughs at the enemy's plan, he's laughing. And I don't know about you, but, but I want to be like God. I want to laugh at the enemy's plan for my life. The simple fact of the matter is that the enemy was completely defeated 2,000 years ago at the cross. He's defeated. And the only access he has into our lives is the ones that we give him. He has no other access. And so I, I, I want to laugh at his plans for my life. I want to laugh at the fact that he wants to break up my family. I want to laugh at the fact that he thinks he can come into this church and have a place in this church. I want to laugh at him. I want to laugh at him. Here's the last one. Last one. Daily habits. Take a chill pill. Take a chill pill. Some of you are just way too stressed out about things that you have zero control over. Zero. I've heard, I've heard people, I've seen people in the news and I've heard people, I mean, they're getting like, they're, getting, they're just like about to go crazy over Britain exiting the EU. How many of you got a vote in that election? Did any of you get a vote in that election? How many of you live in Britain? Anybody here live? We might have one or two. Anybody live in Britain? You have, it has nothing to do with you. I mean, I know globally it's got a deal and it's going to affect the economy. But there is nothing that Sean Wood in Berkeley County right now can do about the fact that Britain wants to leave the EU. Nothing. Not, absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I just look at it and go, all right. You know what? 
I get one vote and my one vote is important and I'm going to have my one vote. But honestly, me stressing out over who's going to win the presidential election, I mean, they're not asking me. Has anybody called you and asked you what you think? I mean, besides a pollster maybe. But has anybody, anybody called, is the Clinton or Trump campaign calling and going, hey, let me, let me uh, quiz you. I want to see what you think about, you know, the state of affairs and what, what, live from Mont's Corner, South Carolina. I just want to find out, like, what's going on. No, they don't care. They don't care. And, and you know what? I need to care less. I need to care less. And all of us, we just need to take a chill pill. Take a chill pill. It just is, we, we have ways too much. Here's what the Bible instructs us to do. Don't worry. It's one of the, one of the clear-cut instructions in the Bible. Don't worry. You are what you feed your mind. And some of you are a big ball of stress because that's all you feed your mind. Stress, 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 stress. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. Here's what I'd say. Change your mind. Change your thinking. Change your life. Don't let somebody else's thinking and what they're trying to do change your world. But you change your. And so it says this, and this is how we're going to end. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Here's something that else Paul told us about prayer. As you're fighting this battle, don't worry about anything, Paul says. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. And then you experience God's peace. Remember, peace is a part of the weapons that we have which exceed anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts. So he told us that in Ephesians. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds, guard our minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So if I trace this all the way back, we worry about death and the end of the world and pain to our kids and uncertainty and all those things. We worry about these things. But what it says is that's not the key to winning the battle. If you want to win the battle, you got to pray at all times. If you want to win the Bible, you battle, you got to pray about everything. If you want to win the battle, you change your thinking by you echo what God's saying by you pray it to him. God, you said this is what you do. You pray in the spirit saying, Holy Spirit, I, I don't have the ability to even pray right now, so I'm going to need you to pray on my behalf. I'm going to need you to say what I need to say. I'm going to need you to echo what I need to echo, God, because I need to be praying about everything instead of worrying. So every time you go to worry, it is actually a reminder to pray. As soon as you start to worry, you go, wait a minute, I'm going to capture. What does he tell us? Capture that thought. I'm going to capture it. I'm going to make it captive to Christ. And by making it captive to Christ, I'm going to put my foot on it, and I'm going to say, thought, you don't get to control my life, but this is what God says about my life. We pray without ceasing pray about everything. And so I want to end on this. The whole series kind of brings up to this. It's about war. But remember what the goal was. What was the goal? Ephesians 6.10, it says, put on God's armor, do all this stuff, pray and, and, and without ceasing, wear all this armor, change your thinking, repent, all those things. Why? Why? So that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. So here, here's what he's saying, is I want you to put your feet in place and the enemy's gonna come at you. you, you you're gonna be tempted to take the ruts of thinking, you're gonna, but you're gonna change your thinking, why? So that you can stand firm. So that you can go, look, you come on at me. But I got everything. He says, the enemy's still gonna come, the battle's still gonna happen, but we're not gonna stay behind. We're right on the front lines, standing firm. That's what God calls us to do. Make war. Stand firm. Don't let the enemy have any ground. It's your ground. He said it's your ground. It says where you stand, that belongs to you. It's your ground. And you stand it. For some of you, it's going to take a change of thinking. For some of you, it's going to mean having peace with God. But for some of you, you're going to have to have faith to walk out where it doesn't feel like you should. And that's all a part making war. Let's pray. God, thank you. That God, you've called us to the battle. But God, you already told us in advance that we can and will win. And so God, with a winning spirit, we walk as victors and not as victims. And God, we take all of the things that 
haunt us, all of the things that push against us, and now we push into you, God. And we stand firm with you. And so, God, I pray now that the atmosphere would change. That, God, the atmosphere of our hearts would change. The atmosphere of our thinking would change. That it would change the filter of our lives. And that because of that, God, our lives would be shaped by you. And so, God, now we respond to you. We respond by going to the cross and repenting, a change of our thinking and our mind. We respond by being vulnerable to protect our hearts, by going to the prayer team and saying, would you pray with me? Would you pray over me? Would you pray for me? We do that with transparency and boldness. God, we take communion remembering that we are at peace with you because of the body and the blood of Jesus. We light a candle asking God that you would be the light in this world and in our world. God, change the atmosphere by us simply showing up and being light. And God, we give of our tithes and offerings because it is an act of worship to be generous to a God who is so generous to us. God, help us to worship you. Help us to usher in your Holy Spirit and that the atmosphere would be changed now. In Jesus' name we pray and we respond. Amen.